So once we get started, um, we'll certainly go through um, the, the presentation today, but just to kind of, as you can see, here's the team. Um, so Bill, who's a, who's the owner and a partner of Smarper, um, of the test management uh, company. He, he, uh, he's helped out uh, Smarper in the past and in the future, and uh, is a very valuable partner uh, within the Smarper ecosystem. Um, I'll, I am one of the sales engineers here in the EMEA office. Um, we're coming live from west of Ireland in sunny Galway. Um, I think it's, we've actually turned down the temperature here, but the temperature was heating up earlier on, but um, we've turned down the temperature because it's so hot. Uh, might as well be the mid. <laughs> I think, Bill, you brought your sunscreen with you, though, didn't you? <laughs> and, and also, we, we also have, uh, as, as part of the, the, the partner team, we've also got uh, David Binns, who's the, the Channel Alliance Manager, and also on the line as well, we've got uh, Christina Lowe, who's the Director of Partner Programs. So I will, um, let, I will hand over firstly to uh, Christina to kind of introduce Smarper and uh, just to kind of give a quick overview there. So Christina, if you want to take it away. Well, thank you so much, Damien, Bill, and Dusty for that incredibly warm welcome. Well, thank you all for joining today for our joint webinar with Track Software. So as Damien discussed, you know, we are super excited to be joining for, to be hosting such events with partners. And today's agenda is gonna be jam packed with all the reasons why it's incredibly important and, and how easy it is to migrate to realize cost savings. So at this point, just wanted to do a friendly and warm welcome, but I'm actually gonna have Bill go through today's agenda as he helped us script it. So take it away, Bill, and I'll be on the line if there's any questions. This session is being recorded, so feel free to share with your team members and other folks at your company that maybe couldn't make the live session. Thanks very much for the introduction, Christina. So as Damien and Christina have mentioned, what we're gonna be talking about today is migrating to test management solutions. So you might be running with something like Excel or other test management solutions and you're looking for either a more cost-effective or more effective test management solution. So in today's agenda, and I absolutely promise you this is the only slide with bullet points on, we are going to cover the four topics listed here. So three of the main reasons for migrating, seven of the complexities you're likely to come up against that you need to consider well before you start any migration process, and we're going to look at what a successful process looks like. So the steps involved, right from requirements capture, right through to the go, uh, the go live stage at the end of the process. The other big thing for us at the moment is none of these tools live in a vacuum and we need to think about the integration up front. So we're going to be talking about integration tools like JIRA, test automation tools like Tesco. So for me then, a little bit about my, my background and why um, I have some strange and weird fascination with the topic of test management. A lot of this comes from uh, many years back where I used to run an open source project which was based around a test management solution and in developing and deploying and building that test management solution you come to realize you know a lot of the complexities that are based around such a simple concept and that concept being just you know, we have a test an expected result so sorry sorry but just before you continue can you maybe get closer to the mic sure sure so that concept of just having a, a test, an expected result, and the result of that being either a pass or fail. And it's such a simple concept, but the moment you start to scale it, when you have more people running tests, when you have different versions of the application to run against, different versions of the test cases, you have automated tests, you have um, scripted tests, and before you know it, you, you have, um, well, <laughs> from the slide here, basically a herd of sheep to manage and to pull all that together. And if you want things like consistent reporting, if you want to see who's allocated to running which tests, whether you're behind schedule or ahead of schedule, then you need some way of managing and controlling the volume of test cases that a, a reasonable size test team starts to develop. And what typically happens or, or what we tend to see in the field is that people will either start off with a top-end solution that's costing them significant sums of money or they'll start off with Excel and they'll quickly outgrow Excel. And it's a question of finding the right solution for the job. And, and that may be Excel for you know, teams that have got one or two testers. 
and you may migrate or move up as you go through the, the life cycle as, as your team develops. Or you may have started off with one of the top end most expensive solutions in the market and you're coming to realize that you're using 20, 30% of all of the functionality in that application and, and really the cost of deploying and using that application doesn't give you the benefits that you could have if some of that money was saved and deployed elsewhere. Bill, let's, let's ask the question to the audience there. What are people doing at the moment for test management? Are they using a third party tool or are they using Excel or maybe are they new to, to test management? So maybe if we can uh, get uh, our audience working with us uh, on this fine day as well. So we, we let that go and if you want to continue on Bill, we can see what, what the response is like. I know I can see some coming in here with Excel, so. Okay, so what, what we want to look at today is, is some of the examples and some of the stages I've been through with some of my clients to migrate them from, from one solution to another, whether that's Excel moving up to um, a tool like QA Complete or whether it's one of the, the, you know, the really expensive enterprise solutions out there that's, that's costing significant amounts of money. And that's where we come into the three main reasons for wanting to migrate. I've worked with some clients that have been running on an enterprise solution that's no longer supported. And for one reason or another, they're not paying the maintenance fees. And they have you know, 10, 20. Some of, some of the companies I've worked with have had over 100 testers working on a, with a test management solution that's not supported. And that is a significant risk. Apologies for the slide here. It was a pretty slide I could find that was uh, <laughs> risk-based. Wasted a lot of university years and nights playing that game. I don't know if any of you... With that. But anyway, so some of these teams have got a significant amount of collateral invested in their test management tool, whether that's test cases, test data, historical test results, and the risk of unsupported or legacy test management tools, if those tools are out of action for any amount of time, is significant. So looking to move to a more cost-effective solution is one of the options here. So uh, some of the clients I work with, they realize that the global licensing models, when they have teams in, in Canada, the US, or Seoul, and, and the UK and Spain and stuff, some of those companies where they have distributed test teams are paying significant amount of money for um, tools to deliver this test management capability. And Bill, just to cut, probably ask a question there is that, um, you know, from the point of view of unsupported is because maybe the, the project that they're working on has run, run a cycle or, you know, is this maybe a company going a new direction or, you know, what have you seen also in the past that maybe kind of, you know, let the, let the, the project or let the tool run out, of, run out of maintenance, run out of, uh, become unsupported really in a, a new version? Yeah, that's a good question. So... In extreme cases, it's, it's just the expense of maintaining that, that licensing. In other cases, like you say, the projects run to completion, but there's still um, historical regression tests in those test management tools that they need to maintain and they need to reuse. But the project as such, there's no budget and they're, they're, not, they're not paying for that tool anymore. Okay, thank you. So a third, a third reason here then is um, maybe we're running with Excel. Now, I know a lot of teams have, have maybe gone on from the, you know, they've been there, seen it, done it with the Excel, starting with Excel, trying to manage that as it scales. But, you know, there is that realization when you start to get two, three, four, five testers in a team that collating, reporting on, and managing test cases in Excel becomes a significant overhead and a significant headache. Yeah, I think I think the Excel is a, is a very good example <clears throat> of what kind of people do uh, with, with test management. Um, it's, it's the easiest way, and everyone's everyone in the world now at this stage has got uh, Excel uh, for for some in some way, shape, or form. And that's the thing is that you know you start building up your spreadsheet, you start building up your tabs in your spreadsheet. It becomes a very complex process to to manage your your, your test cases, and you know then also sharing those kind of um, you know, those Excel versions and, you know, the whole thing with version control and, you know, access and uh, centralization. These are all kind of buzzwords I'm throwing out there, but in essence, that's what kind of, um, you know, 
prompts people to, to kind of upgrade from Excel because they, they, they need more of a centralized uh, repository and, and tool to kind of help them manage the, the, the process more efficiently. Absolutely. And it's easy for me to say, but the, the sooner you look at migrating, the easier it is mm. to move up to a tool because it turns into a real bowl of spaghetti when you end up with you know, 30, 40, hundreds of, of Excel spreadsheets all with uh, test cases in. And managing that really does become a headache quite quickly. And the sooner you approach that issue, and the sooner you deal with it, the better. Okay. And uh, the other thing as well is that as kind of people start using um, or start looking at test management tools, um, other things like, you know, automation. Um, at some stage in your testing cycle, you're going to need to think about automation and also kind of having tools and are looking at tools when you're looking to migrate, you know, whether they can handle not just manual tests and, and traceability, but also looking at uh, the automation side of things as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things we'll move on to in a minute is, is how this domain of test management is changing. I mean, it is no longer just a repository of documents with test cases and a bit of test data. It has moved on to being a repository for storing, you know, maybe the requirements capture for test automation or automated tests. It might be um, some sort of BDD script. You know, it, it's becoming a much bigger um, puzzle and solution for you know, agile test teams as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, when you start talking again with agile, you know, the whole, I think someone asked a question there, like, you know, what's the percentage of, of an organization that is doing automation today? You know, those figures kind of vary um, from organization to organization, you know, whether it be small, medium or enterprise uh, customers. We're seeing a lot more now uh, compared to two years ago. I, I don't know about your experience, Bill, but, you know, from, from us talking to, to smartware customers, <clears throat> we're seeing a lot more a mix of um, automated and manual testing being done now over the last couple of days, or oh, God, last couple of days, couple of, couple of uh, years. So that, that, that trend is certainly changing from pure manual. And I think they say there's still about 80% of testing still manual. Uh, yeah, I, I read that somewhere. Though. I was actually, we were doing a webinar a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and did a bit of research and 80% are still doing manual testing, which is a staggering amount. But there is there's, there's one thing here, and automation is only going one way, and that is getting bigger, and there is going to be more automation. And the issue now for many companies is, is not implementing automation, it's trying to combine the manual test results and the automated test results to give you a holistic picture of where you are with your, your test effort as a whole. And again, this is a, a central role that a test management tool can play in terms of bringing all of that um, test evidence, test results together into one place for a consistent level of reporting. And, and is, is, that, is, that, is that the kind of, you know, when, when you talk to customers that are migrating, like obviously you've got the, the costs and everything there as well, but also the, the, um, the fact that, you know, you're getting more traceability in there. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is that visibility. And that's what it all comes down to, visibility of where you are in the test cycle and the, and the release cycle. And you, the only way to really work from uh, the evidence is to have all of that information collated in one place. And, and the tools that are out there for test management, most of them have got APIs, but you know, whether you've got homegrown automation system or whether you're using off-the-shelf automation tools, you know, being able to bring all of that test automation results and the artifact into a central location where your manual test results are as well to be able to report on that is, is, is a key tenet of any of the, uh, the test projects that I've been working on. Yeah, so, so like it, it is... You know, as I says, like, you know, and just going back to the kind of question I asked, there are a mix of kind of people that have third party tools and also um, are, are doing that uh, using Excel. So it, it is kind of a, a mix uh, audience of, of what they're doing at the moment. And I actually see someone there that actually hasn't done test management before. So, you know, some, some new people in there. So just, just um, a, a bit of an example. And so one of the companies I worked with was a, a global gaming company um, and they were running on a... Um, a, an enterprise test management solution. They had teams in Seoul, in Canada, in the US, the UK, and Spain, uh, over 100 testers. All of them, well, some of them using Excel, some of them using this uh, legacy test management system, and they wanted to bring that together to give them the benefits of some consistency, whether that was process consistency, reporting consistency, 
they wanted to bring teams on board that weren't using any test management solutions so that they've got a higher level of uptake across their, their test teams across the globe. Which gave them both the improved reporting, um, better integration to other tools like JIRA, and of course that, that significant cost savings as well. And is that, is that something you see quite a lot of, like, you know, when we talk to customers, um, you know, a dispersed team, you know, has become more common um, in terms of the testing side of things. Yeah, that's, that's an absolutely key point. Um, you know, testing is never completed in one place, whether you've got end users running UAT tests on, on, on site, whether you've got distributed teams out in India or Malaysia or wherever. And, and having that tool to bring all of those teams together to give you that consistency both on process and reporting is, is one of the big benefits of implementing a test management solution effectively. Okay, and that leads neatly on to um, some of the complexities to watch out for because these are the sort of seven components that, that I come up against every time we look at doing a migration, whether that's from Excel or whether it's from a, another product or whether they're just trying to combine solutions across an organization. And those seven things are assignment. You, you know, you need to know which tests have been assigned to which testers, and those testers need to have that clarity as well. You know, for many organizations, we've got version control. You need to know which version of a test case is being run against which version of an application, especially in highly regulated organizations, maybe the nuclear industry or, or medical. And that, that is becoming more and more now of a kind of... Uh... A requirement um, in, in any application, but certainly uh, you know in ter terms of test management, and especially when you've got a, a dispersed team, um, having that version control as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like yourself, we come up uh, a lot of questions come up around version control and how uh, what version is mapped to what release, even you yeah. know, things like that that kind of help with the traceability. And the, the third thing there then is, is parameterization. So, you know, this, this whole concept of writing a test case and being able to reuse it with different data. Um, I mean, there is no point these days of, of writing the same test case over and over again. You, you need to have that capability within the tool. Number four then on my list is uh, libraries. So, you know, this is as old as, as testing itself, having a library of reusable test cases. But in migrating, there needs to be some consistency between the product you're migrating from and the product you're migrating to. Number five, and we'll, we'll look at these actually in QA Complete in a minute, but number five on my list is uh, result aggregation. So you know, you've got results coming in from testers maybe all over the globe. You've got results coming in against different versions of the application, you know, different releases, different builds, different sprints. All of that needs to be easily pulled together to give you that consistency of reporting. Number six on my list then would be retesting. So, you know, Tests result in bugs. Those bugs get fixed, and you need to have a, a simple way of you know, seeing that a defect's been fixed and being able to turn that into a test and retest and check that that, uh, that fix has done the job. Um, too many horror stories in my own career as a tester of seeing bug fixes and then doing the release and actually you know, we didn't fix it, and that's, that's just embarrassing. Number seven then is the configuration and releases. You know, we're running many tests against many configurations, whether that's browsers, whether that's UAT, SIT environments, et cetera, whatever, and against sprints and releases. And, and having that visibility is, is key from any test management tool you're working with. So, so if, if I was to put you on your, on your spot, on our spot, uh, <laughs> I'll do this to the game. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to ask for your bank account or anything like that, but um, <laughs> if, I to, if I was to put you on, on, on the spot, what, out of those seven techniques, which would be your, your top three? Uh, my top three on there, I mean, version control, as you mentioned, is becoming bigger because people want that and need that traceability, especially in the highly regulated industries. Um, assignment is in there in the top three as well because a tester needs to be able to log into a tool and see exactly which tests he or she needs to be running that day then and there. And I would go for the results aggregation as, as the, the third one there because... You know, all of this is about having that visibility, that release visibility and the quality of your product prior to release. And without that ability to aggregate results, you're, you're, you're still in the dark to a certain extent. Yeah. No more on-the-spot questions. No, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep it to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just have a, have a quick look at those. Um, and then this isn't a full demo of, of QA Complete here. This is just a, a look at those seven key points. You know, if people are interested in a full demo of, of QA Complete, you know, 
feel free to contact Damien or myself after this. But what I want to highlight is, is how some of these tools actually implement those, those key sort of test management complexities. So the first one then is assignment. And in, in QA Complete, for example, we have the ability to assign test cases both in terms of the test in the library. So in here, we've got the owner of the test. We might have a reviewer. We also have the ability to collate those tests into test sets and assign at the test set level as well. But where this really comes into play is, is the test um, execution, where we might want to assign those test cases for execution to different, different testers. And again, that can be done at the test case level, test set level, or even uh, at the individual test step level, in, in if, if that degree of um, granularity is required. So the, the third, uh, the second one then is version control. And as I always say to a lot of people I'm working with, you know, this is, it's kind of optional in QA Complete. If you don't want to worry about version control, test complete, uh, QA Complete will just manage it in the background for you. But if version control of test cases and, and having that visibility of which test case is run by, against which test, and which release, then test, uh, QA Complete does track all of that information. So every time you modify a test case, the version number of that test case gets rolled. You can even roll back on those versions if you want to. So maybe version nine here is still in development and we want to roll back and only use version six in our, our test runs and our test execution. And all of that traceability of which version against which release is, is maintained within QA Complete in the results history as well. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. I think, you know, if, if you kind of put everything together, the uh, the run history of uh, of your test run. So, for example, in this uh, functional test here, you have you're showing on the screen. You know, in the run history tab, you've got a history of all the test runs based on your releases, your configuration, and you know, as you says, if you find a bug in, in in version nine of the test and it needs to be fixed, but we know it's it's working on version six, we can roll that back very very quickly. You know, without having to go and you know, get your test manager to kind of uh, give you access to the, the, the previous version, you can do that inside of QA, QA Complete. So it's kind of having that control yourself as well once you're assigned to the, um, once you're assigned to the, the, uh, the test. Yeah. So next on that list then was, um, was parameterization. So this is the ability to write a test once and then maybe data drive it with, with different data sets. And again, in, in QA Complete, we refer to that as token values. In each test case, we can upload um, a data set, maybe CSV data. And when it comes to the execution, QA Complete automatically creates the multiple instances of that test case um, at runtime for you. Yeah, and, and that again becomes important if you're running, as you says, uh, a lot of tests, uh, you know, instead of having to type in the, the physical, you know, say username and password, you can uh, loop through it uh, reading from a spreadsheet. So when you run the test and the test runner comes up, you, you get to see the different uh, usernames and passwords that have been read in from the CSV file. So a, a, a useful tool, albeit, you know, kind of, I like to see a little bit of automation in a, in a manual process, but uh, it certainly cuts down on time in terms of management as well. And it all helps. Everything helps, even down to small things. So for all my list then was the, the concept of test libraries and, you know, this goes back decades from you know, the start of testing effectively, but everybody has a repository or a library of test cases that they want to reuse. Um, and the way QA Complete manages that is, is quite clever in many ways because not only can you divide it up by associating them with folders, but we can link individual tests to releases as well so you can see which tests are applicable for which releases. And then even a, a third way of slicing and dicing this, we can actually put tags and group group those tests as well. So it's all about finding those test cases, grouping them into test sets for your test execution runs. Yeah, imagine trying to do that in Excel, you know, with your different tabs. There we go. Uh -huh. I, 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 I think you mentioned the word spaghetti junction. I think uh, <laughs> it would certainly be like that again. So five on my list then would be the results aggregation. And then this comes down to, to our end game really you know, that there is no point in entering all this data and all this traceability if, if we can't report on where we are on a particular release. 
And everything in QA Complete is, is designed around this concept of a release. So we link defects, we link tests, user stories, everything goes to that release. So that when we come and look at the releases in the test runs, everything's aggregated in one view. We can see which tests are still uh, in execution. We can rerun tests. We can, we can delete test runs that perhaps um, have been, been invalidated for some reason. Everything's about pulling that together and then passing that on, and we can look at that uh, at a later stage with, with some of the graphs and reports that we need for that uh, release visibility. Yeah, the, the, I suppose that the key thing there is, um, you know, we've introduced the kind of uh, rerunning of tests uh, uh, from the run history uh, screen in the last couple of releases. So, you know, as test management evolves, um, you know, gear complete kind of... Uh, gears its or uses its roadmap or looks at the roadmap based on the trends there. So, you know, we look towards our, our partners like Bill to kind of, uh, you know, they've got, you, you guys have got your, your feet on the ground, you're on site, you're different customers, different, uh, you know, industries uh, day in, day out. So getting feedback from the likes of Bill um, helps us kind of define how our roadmap works as well. And even from, from um, people on, on the call as well, you know, are happy to kind of get some input from you and in terms of where, where things are. And then number six on my list was the concept of retesting. So what we're looking at here is the, the idea that, you know, we've found defects. You know, those defects might be raised within QA Complete and might be synced up to JIRA so that the project team using JIRA have got visibility of those defects. But once that defect's fixed, you need that visibility back in your test management solution. Because without that retest step, you're, you know, you're in the dark still when it comes to your releases. And with QA complete, you know, we can drill down on the defects. We can see which defects have been fixed in which releases. And then we can work on the, the adding linked items. And we can write a specific test that has traceability back to, to that defect. And in doing that, we could either combine that test in a, a, a subsequent test run as part of a test set, or as, as Damien was alluding to there, we can actually you know, rerun that individual test and link it to a, a specific release if we need to. Uh, I hear this quite a lot, Bill, um, I don't know about you, but um, you know, people that are kind of, have been doing the same process day in, day out with the test management, uh, I find it hard to adapt to, to a new tool, a new process. And, um, I suppose what you're showing here today in, in relation to QA Complete is, is the ease of use and, and the flow of kind of, you know, the four, the other seven different uh, areas, um, you know, versioning, uh, test runs, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's the ease of use of using the tool. I think, you know, people need to look at, at the mindset uh, of how they adapt to a new process and, you know, the, the long-term uh, ROI or return on investment um, in having such a tool in-house um, compared to what they're currently doing. And that is one of the big advantages of the migration process is that you, know, you take stock of where you are at the moment and you look at those processes and you see how you can enhance them, improve them and make them more efficient as you, as you move over and migrate to a new tool as well. Mm -hmm. And is, is that one of the key things as well? So when you talk about um, when you get into this stage where you realize you need to migrate and you start looking at other tools, you know, are, the, are those the things like that at top of the list where process-driven um, based on migration is, is an important part? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, if you don't start thinking about those parts of the process up front, and, and there may be others um, that are, are more pertinent for you out of that list of seven, but if you don't take stock and stop and look at those processes up front and consider how you want to improve your process, you know, you're, just, you know, you're on a bit of a losing, losing game there if you're not careful. Yeah. Okay, and uh, last on the list then was configuration and releases. And again, in QA Complete Land, we've got this, this concept of, of defining configurations. So whether that be you want to trace tests being run against the UAT environment, or SIT environment, or dev environment, or whether you want to get as granular as, as you know, which browser we're running our individual tests on so you've got that test coverage making sure. But all of that can be configured and set up within QA Complete. And when you come to execute the tests, then you can define those releases or, uh, sorry, those configurations that you're running against. And again, end game, need to consider how we're going to report on that and, and what visibility we need of that, that sort of traceability to configurations at the end.
Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, obviously, you've got uh, reporting, you've got nice graphs and everything inside of uh, Excel, but again, a lot of manual kind of, uh, you know, selecting tabs and selecting cells and date, date selectors and date ranges and stuff like that, data ranges or rows and columns. But, uh, you know, to be able to kind of do two or three clicks and have a, as a comprehensive report is important as well. Yeah, especially when it comes to recovery, uh, to coverage reports and um, you know, traceability to defects and, and status of that, that release. Right, any questions from anybody there on the um, technical complexities we've covered there? Not yet. I think everyone's quiet. I think everyone uh, is observing, observing the, uh, the, the information. But please, please don't be afraid. Um, you know, I, I don't bite. I don't know about Bill. So, um, but look at if any any questions, please keep them coming in. It's early. It's. <laughs> so the next next part then. So once you've considered those technical complexities at the start, and and you confident that you've looked at your processes and you understand those processes and how you want to enhance them, you know, you're really getting into the the stages you want to follow to migrate successfully and. and break that down into nine, you need to start looking at the requirements. You need to define those processes up front. And, and that can be quite simple, um, you know, just looking at maybe whether or not you've got a review process on your test cases, whether you still need that review process. Um, planning for the end game, and it, it, we're talking about the reporting side of it here. It's best to go through a sort of small proof of concept um, with, with one project, they usually would set up one project with all the custom fields, the <coughs> workflow, and from the basis of that, build out some of the reports that the, the management team or even testers need visibility of to see where you are with your test process. Uh, workflow metadata. Uh, when you migrate, you have custom fields, you've got your own custom workflow. That either needs to be mirrored or it needs to be enhanced as part of that migration. You need to think about what you do and you don't want. Some projects don't need migrating, they just need archive. Some projects you may want the historical test results from, others you may not, but it all needs to be considered up front on a project by project basis. Data extraction, so when I start talking about data migration in test management tools, you know, we're all aware that you, you can do a CSV export test case and then import it into another tool. And test com uh, QA Complete has that capability as do most other tools. What I'm talking about here is where we do a data migration where you've got historical test results. You've got test sets, you've got test artifacts with test data, uh, you've got attachments. Uh, and that becomes a, a, bigger, a bigger game as such. And we're, we're talking about um, looking at using APIs of QA complete to import test sets. Um, you know, this, this legacy data can become so complex over you know, five, six, seven years where you've been using a particular tool, and then there needs to be some careful consideration on how you're going to extract that data, and then clean it as well. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned already, Bill, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you mentioned uh, CSV, but you also there mentioned um, um, the API side of things. I think we were having a discussion off air um, earlier on about, uh, you know, when to use CSV and when to use kind of APIs. So I don't know if that's something you want to share with the audience and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It can, I mean, you keep it simple. If you can export your test cases and all you need is the test cases imported into the new tool, then CSV is the way to go. Because it's always built into the tools you're working with. And it's very simple to you know, do the field mapping in, in QA complete when you do that import. It's when we get into things like attachments, um, when we get into traceability to user stories in, in, in other tools and those kinds of areas, that, that's when you need to start looking at things in a bit more detail and looking at maybe using those APIs to, to migrate that data in a more automated fashion. The other big advantage that many companies find of, of going through this migration process is the ab ability to clean their data. You know, as things progress over years of using tools, you know, different teams have got different custom fields, have got different workflows, and being able to report um, across projects when everybody's using different custom fields, different workflows becomes a real headache. So that migration process is an ideal opportunity to look at building the consistency within your process and within those projects so that you do have the ability to do 
across project reports, for example, once you've, you've completed that migration and everybody's on the same tool, the same process. So then into the data import side of things, and we've touched on this a bit, you know, whether that's CSV import, Excel import, or whether we're looking at doing something a little bit more customized with uh, using the APIs to upload lots of attachments, thousands, tens of thousands of attachments, for example. And then you're not gonna do a migration project without some degree of testing. And you shouldn't have any problems finding people that are gonna be critical enough to look at how your migration process is going. But it, it is a key part of the engagement of the test team in that you, know, you go through a proof of concept, you migrate one or two projects, you, know, you get the test team to evaluate that um, data import and see how that new, if enhanced perhaps, workflow is, is implemented within the test tool. And you may have a couple of iterations of that to make sure that you've got, uh, you know, you've got that import working effectively. Then the last step, step nine, is the archive process. You know, you may decide that you don't want to migrate some of the projects because it's historical data, but you certainly need to consider whether you're going to keep that data, whether it's exported into PDF, whether you just export it in CSV, but you need to be clear about what you do want to retain and what you don't want to retain after you finish that migration. So if we, if we look at the kind of the title of, of this webinar, like realizing the cost savings um, for migration to, to QA complete, um, you know, the, the whole thing here, we, we, we talked about kind of, uh, obviously time saving has been one, but also cost. And, you know, we haven't touched on cost, so to speak, in terms of monetary value, like, you know, return on investment. Where do you see kind of you know the big gain in terms of in terms of cost for people migrating over to kind of a QA complete? Say for example from Excel. Uh, from Excel, it, it's definitely that ability to pull together reports far quicker and, and have those reports at your fingertips. I mean, when, once you start getting 10, 20 Excel sheets as part of a project, you know, collating that data is is not a ten minute job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is taking a test lead or a test manager hours to pull that information together. And not only that, by the time you pulled it together, things have moved on with the testing. Um, so it's, it's out of date very quickly and you want that visibility you know, right at your fingertips. Yeah, I think that becomes more important as well when people start to adopt in Agile and DevOps and all that kind of uh, way. Like, you know, so you still have people obviously in a waterfall environment, but, you know, more and more people. And I think now, this year more than anything, uh, a lot of people now you hear of agile transformation, you know, and more so than digital transformation last year, but more agile transformation this year. And, uh, you know, that's again helps this, this migration process helps uh, improve the cost. Like, you know, when you're costing out that, you know, you need to kind of have a tool that's reliable, but also gives you that reporting at your fingertips, gives you that data, gives you that kind of um, accessibility to, to the overall traceability of the test. Absolutely, and a, a lot of the Agile teams I work with, you know, they, they've got the user story um, definition part of the process right. They, they've got the CI bit right. You know, they've got automated tests, but actually when you ask them, you've got a user story perhaps in Jira, you know, where's your visibility of which tests have been run against that and where the, what's the quality of that implementation of that user story, but they can't tell you. And the place for that information is usually a test management tool where you're feeding in manual test results against that user story and you're feeding in the results from automation as part of the CI process, maybe out of Jenkins and test complete. And all of that should be fed back into the test management tool and then linked back to traceability to tools like Jira. So you've got that visibility within, within your um, user story record that you might, be, you might be looking at. And actually that's, that's probably a good point just to, to stop and have a look at the, the integration capability of you're looking at me you say you're going to have to do something now am i <laughs> <laughs> i thought i'd get away likely yeah, though yeah, it's got to be your turn <laughs> no look at um yeah so you know you you've you shown kind of uh, what what um what the integration is or what, what the what the um what the flow is in terms of the seven habits um what we'd like to show kind of now here is you know what kind of integrations that are available um so hopefully when you see this, like, you know, the, the big thing for us at the moment is uh, a lot of people are asking about uh, JIRA integration. 
and you know previous releases of Kia Compete we had a standalone but you know over the last uh, year or so we've now incorporated that into our UI and the ease of use uh, of creating um, a Jira c- connectivity is very simple um, you know you've got your you've got your kind of uh, you got your project inside of uh, Kia Compete and then you got your project inside of um, inside of uh, inside of Jira and uh, what you want to do is you want to map the uh, the bug to the defect inside of uh, Kia Complete, and then obviously you got the mappings. Now, you know, Bill, you mentioned uh, the customization. Um, if you've got customized fields either in um, in Kia Complete or in Jira, we we can map those to each other as well. So the seamless kind of integration in there is important to have as well. And once you have that done, then you've got the the bi-directional synchronization, and we also have kind of your defects as well. So defects and, and, uh, and requirements are, are the two kind of uh, uh, parts of JIRA that we synchronize in with. And once you kind of create your defect either through a test run inside a test library or even created in your defect section, once they are created, then they're synchronized across to kind of um, to, to, uh, to JIRA. And uh, one such example here is one I've, as I say, uh, you, you prepared earlier, and you can see here down at the bottom, it's actually passed over the steps. So it's passed over the steps is also who, who's reported that as well. And if we go into kind of Kia Complete again and do a search for the defect, you will see it inside here as well. And at the top of that defect, you will also see a link to your, your Jira project or your Jira a ticket inside of uh, your Jira instance. So that's seamless integration. And when you update the defect inside of Kia Complete, say it's from in progress to done, um, you will then see it also probably get over to Jira. So, you know, it's got that synchronization going on as well. If you create a new defect inside of uh, Kia Complete or inside of Jira, it will also synchronize across. And you can see here, it's got the, it's got the, uh, it's got the, the link to your, your, um, your GAL 647, all right? So the integration is a big part. And you know, we talked about, you know, migrating over, you know, legacy data from Jira, like requirements and, and bugs, you can do that using this synchronization. So when you set up the configuration, it will ask, do you want to synchronize across everything in that project to Kia Complete? And you can do that very quickly, all right? <clears throat> the other thing then is, uh, and we talked about it before, is now more and more people and more and more companies are looking to do automation. So again, what you're looking at here is a mix of a manual and an automated testing. Now, for example, if I look in some of these tests I've created here, um, what we've got is we've got a mix of automated and manual testing. If I could spell now, it'd be good. Okay, let's see here now. Uh, Actually, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to do a different one. So what we have is if we've got some support for a number of different automation tools. Um, you know, obviously, we've got our own SmartPair tools, which is uh, Test Complete and uh, REST API, Ready API. But you can see in here in this kind of test setup, um, I have got manual steps in here. So these are the manual steps, logging onto my desktop, put my username, and then checking out. But I've also got my automation in here as well. And very simply, I can just go and create that. So I've got my test agent, which is either a Selenium script, a Ready API or SOAP API, or even a, a test complete script. Now, you can also add in other automation tools. But again, you know, out of the box, we support these, these frameworks. Um, you can use the API then to generate your own test agent to then kind of uh, work against third-party systems. But again, it's going back to the traceability and reporting of manual and automated testing. You know, a lot of people that are looking at automation will tend to still do manual testing, so they won't do a big bang approach. And to be able to kind of trace that uh, those executions as well is important. And you know, for example, with kind of uh, test complete for, for which is our front end UI automation tool, you can see in here in the run history that it actually provides the log output for you as well. And with the kind of um, information that you have, what you can see here as well is you can also see the um, the the what you call the the, the reporting inside of inside the Kia Complete without having to go outside to the tool itself, all right? Now, if I can find an example, I can show you that. But in essence, the two main kind of integrations that, that we, we talk about um, is around automation and obviously Jira is a big one there as well.
And that's the key thing that I'm finding with a lot of the Agile teams. It, it's that completing the loop, you know, user story definition, test case definition for that user story, running the test, whether that's manual or automated, and then feeding those results back in so that the person who wrote the user story in a tool like Jira has the visibility of, and then they don't care whether it's automated or manual, they just want the visibility of whether or not that user story has been implemented properly and the tests have confirmed that. Yep. So a lot of things there. Um, obviously, we've, we've touched on it very, very quickly, but again, it gives you an idea of the, the integration um, with, you know, with, with the defect tracking systems you know, and also the automation tools. All right. Okay. So the last bit we, we wanted to cover is more about the, the soft side of things, you know, how you implement and sell this within an organization and, and get that momentum going. Because the, the one thing that kills these migration efforts is, is inertia and, and building that momentum amongst your team to to migrate especially when you've got large distributed teams can can take a bit of a, a kick start and again there's there's a there's a few things to consider here i mean the the really smooth migrations i've worked on that there has been strong leadership and that's usually coming from the, the test manager and the test manager has that authority to say I, I know you've got concerns in your particular project about migrating. I know there's going to be some disrupt, disruption, but you are going to migrate on this date. Unless you can present me with you know, really solid reasons why this migration should not go ahead, you know, we are setting this date and we are going with it because it's got to happen. The second, second thing then really is the teams. And to get that momentum going, sometimes you'll, you'll find some teams are keener than others. You know, pick Pick the teams that are keen to, to migrate initially. Start with them, prove it, demonstrate it amongst the organization, and then it's, it's easier to bring the other teams on board. And, and then maybe some teams aren't really on board to start with because they have um, relevant concerns, but as they see the issues ironed out with the migration, see it start to move slow, uh, smoothly, then you know, it's easier to bring them on board. Yeah, I, I've seen this before. <laughs> it, it's like adaptability, really. Like, you know, you've got um, people that have been using, um, been doing the same thing, you know, for the last three or four years. And it's like anything, like, you know, once you kind of drive one car that you're comfortable with, you kind of buy that model car year in, year out. It's like anything, like, you know, once you get comfortable, people like to stay in their own comfort zone and uh, to adapt a new tool, um, you know, whether you're being forced or not, it, you know, people aren't going to buy in. I had a great example this morning. My, I, the email, the web-based email client I use, they've been saying that they're going to move over to a new UI for, for weeks, and I've not gone because I just didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it. It couldn't be, you know, it's going to be a lot of hassle. They forced me to move over this morning, you know, and within 10 minutes, it's fine. It's, it's the fear of the unknown, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I was a bit slower to begin with, but you know, it's... Couple of minutes and, and you're, you're up and away, and it, it's no problem. The third thing then is timetable. Uh, it's great. It's much better if you've got clear timetable about which projects are going to be which migrating and when. Communications key. Uh, regular email updates to say you know where we are in the process, who's involved with the process, what at what point you will be involved in that process, and, and you will be migrating all, all helps. And training. And I'm, I'm not just talking about product out of the in training here. I'm talking about uh, training that's written bespoke for your migration so that you get conversion training. You know, this is how you're doing it now. This is how it's going to work in the new tool. Not just this is the new tool. You know, they want to understand yeah. how it's going to change. I, th I think you, 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 you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I think it's uh, you know, conversion training. I think that's, you know, that's one of the key training parts there. And six, engagement. And you'll get a lot more engagement if you have your test teams helping you test with the migration process. And if you've got the skills in-house, you may as well use it. And finally then, seven. You, know, we, you want to review at regular points in the process, you know, before and after on, on individual projects, see what went well, see what didn't go well, and make enhancements and improve it as you do 
each project in turn. So just to end I, on, on one slide for me, I mean, the, the test management landscape is changing, whether it's with Agile, BDD, um, but test management tools still have a, a role to play. You know, they're no longer some pointless documentation exercise. You know, you should be using them as a traceability tool. You know, all that feedback into tools like JIRA so that the project team um, have visibility of the tests run against user stories. You know, if you're doing exploratory testing, you know, you know, at least have a little bit of a checklist that maybe you put in your test management tool. So again, you've got traceability back to JIRA so that somebody else can step into your, a toe, uh, into your shoes and run those tests at a later stage, even if it's just one-liners. And third, and this is becoming bigger, is, is using them as a requirements capture tool for automation tests. You know, you may have an automation team um, in a different country. If you've got your test cases documented well in a test management tool, it acts as a requirement or a user story for an automation team to pick it up and automate it. And it's far smoother and far quicker. But the one thing this should not be, the tool you're using shouldn't be a risk or a drain on any of your financial resources. There are massive benefits to be had from implementing and using the right test management tool. You know, it's just a question of putting a little bit of time and effort into it to realize those benefits. Yeah, time and effort is always helps in the long run. And I, 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 do, I do like your picture, Bill, uh, the, the birds migrating. Well, it had to be a theme somewhere. <laughs> Okay, is there any questions from, um, from anybody at this stage? I think everyone's just busy um, you know, taking it all in. Hopefully people will now take, take all this kind of information. And it has been kind of informative. Um, as it says, in the beginning, there's, there's uh, no debt by slides. As I, as, uh, I must say I was impressed with the, the, the uh, slides and the images on there. But yeah, look, at, um, first of all, like, I'd like to take the time to kind of thank you, Bill, for kind of uh, uh, coming here today and kind of uh, you know sharing your experiences and uh, your your knowledge around you know the migration process. Uh, I know you've done quite a lot uh, of migrations over your of your career, and you know hopefully people will see the benefits of uh, migrating from the current process to another. So you know um you know the the whole thing here is that uh, to get more kind of feel for the different tools and you know the different migrations certainly like you know. I'm here for my for for from a QA complete point of view and to help people understand and also Bill, you're 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 available to kind of uh, get a bit more in depth into into QA complete product. Um, have a look on our, our smartware uh, website as well. Absolutely, thanks, Damien. And uh, you know, I would say if anybody's looking at migration processes, you know, get in touch. We have checklists, we have um, handbooks that can be useful for conversion training. You know, there's a lot of resources we can make available. You know, even if you are just looking at doing a CSV import. You know, we don't have to get involved, but we've got collateral that can help you. Yeah, and as again, like, you know, both uh, Bill and myself are here to, to kind of help, you know, through that process. Uh, don't be afraid to get in touch, either via what, what you can see on the screen there, um, smartbird.com. You know, again, we've got uh, a number of different tools. Um, I'm going to do a cheeky plug here, but um, you know, from the front end to your back end to your, your development, testing, performance. So don't be afraid to look at uh, different tools, all right? So thanks very much everyone for attending today and uh, I do appreciate your, your time uh, to take uh, the time out today to, to, to uh, listen to the Bill and myself talk and hopefully you got some useful information from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And have everyone. a good day now.